Okay, so I will be introducing some adventures that we uh, had for Boolean uh, satisfiability and to show uh, how it can be applied to many different applications of, uh, in logic synthesis. And as you have noticed, uh, my background is more in electrical engineering. So you might be wondering why uh, this kind of computer science problem, Boolean satisfiability, is uh, used in uh, electrical engineering. I will be uh, talking about it. Uh, so for the outline, first uh, I will uh, give a quick uh, motivation why we look at uh, this uh, Boolean satisfiability in the domain of uh, electronic design automation. And then I will go into Boolean satisfiability, quickly introduce it, and then I will show uh, two examples of the application. And then I try to summarize this talk. Uh, so uh, because I'm in electrical engineering, so one of the tasks, uh, what we do is we try to automate the process of integrated circuit design. And uh, uh, this is the typical IC design flow. So starting from the uh, hardware description language, uh, we try to, uh, basically the circuit designer try to write their own uh, design in terms of some uh, high level language. And then there will be some automatic tool uh, to help us compile this kind of program into the final circuit layout. So it will go through several uh, steps. For example, there will be some RTL synthesis, try to translate the uh, HT, uh, HDL specification into a, a circuit analyst. And then there will be some logic synthesis tool to help us uh, translate this kind of uh, logic gate level into a more refined uh, transistor level design. And then with physical design tool, uh, we can translate this transistor design into the circuit layout. And with this kind of layout, we can do the uh, manufacture the photo mask. And the photo mask would help us use uh, uh, manufacture to fabricate the integrated circuit in the foundry, for example. And finally, after the fabrication, we got the final integrated circuit. And then you see uh, these ICs applied uh, everywhere in, this, uh, uh, in computers, uh, mobile phone, and so on. So uh, what we do here is basically to design the design automation tool to automate the whole process. And uh, in this talk, what we will be focusing uh, will be the logic synthesis part and also some of the verification part. Uh, so let me uh, try to introduce, uh, so what is logic synthesis? So given uh, a high level, uh, get level or function level description of our finite state machine, uh, what we would like to do is try to translate this into the get level implementation. So basically you use this logic gates, free flops, uh, you can uh, implement this kind of uh, more abstract function view of the uh, state transition system. And so uh, we can view logic synthesis as the, uh, in, in terms of two kinds of uh, different approach. One approach is try to, uh, given the Boolean function expression, so functions, uh, logic synthesis will try to return output, uh, optimize the logic network. And uh, another interpretation of logic synthesis is uh, given Boolean or temporal constraints of our uh, system that we want to design, then logic synthesis tool can help us try to derive a solution circuit. So these are two uh, different interpre interpretations of logic synthesis that can be uh, used to derive useful uh, logic circuits uh, for some constraint or for some application. So, uh, and the fundamental objects that we need to manipulate with uh, is Boolean function. So, and therefore we need to efficiently try to represent uh, Boolean function so that we can manipulate uh, some of the Boolean reasoning task. So we say we need a Boolean function representation for main two reasons. Uh, one is because what we want to really uh, implement is the final circuit. That is a circuit representation anyway. And the second part is we need to have an efficient data structure in a software point of view. How do we uh, 
uh, efficiently do those Boolean reasoning or logical constraint solving. So, and here is the uh, evolution of the data structures that people have has been using to manipulate Boolean function. For example, in the 1950s uh, to uh, 70s, people are using a uh, truth table to represent a Boolean function. And the scale of this, you can represent, uh, for example, uh, up to uh, maybe around uh, 16 uh, var Boolean variables that would be big enough for you to use the uh, uh, pencil paper to, to write down these Boolean functions. And in the 1980s, uh, 70s, uh, people start to uh, migrate the data structure using the uh, summer product expression, or we call it disjunctive normal form representation of the Boolean function. And in the 1990s, people starting to invent a new data structure that we call it as binary decision diagram. So basically, it's a binary tree you use this kind of reduced binary tree structure to represent Boolean function. And the scalability is uh, higher, can be up to, for example, 100 Boolean variables that you can manipulate. And uh, in the late 1990s, and uh, also uh, starting from 2000, people are starting to use uh, set solving, certifiability solving, to manipulate those uh, Boolean function uh, so uh, here we mentioned about uh, uh, CNF, the conjunctive normal form representation. And sometimes uh, we, in a circuit domain, we would use AIG, that is an inverted graph, to represent a Boolean function. So, sorry, AIG? Uh, an, inverted, an end inverted graph. So basically, uh, later I will quickly show, it's basically uh, a Boolean network. And Every node, every vertex has only two inputs. And uh, each node is an uh, end gate, two input end gate. And the inverter can be just an attribute on the edge. Later I will uh, go into uh, the detail of it. And so uh, you can see uh, the migration of different data structures. And currently what is most efficient and you uh, maybe, uh, uh, if you use some of the uh, Boolean reasoning uh, tool, perhaps they would use CNF or AIG as the underlying data structure. So uh, let me mention, so ABC, these are the, the tools developed at UC Berkeley, uh, starting Expresso, uh, uh, CIS. Those are the logic synthesis tools. Uh, and ABC is nowadays the state of the art. So uh, here we quickly go through some of the uh, data structures. Uh, for example, uh, truth table uh, is a representation, as, as we mentioned. Boolean formula, we can have sum of product, product of sum. Uh, BDD, as I mentioned. And there are Boolean network. They will be the representation of Boolean function. And AIG, as I mentioned, it's, it's a specialized Boolean network. And why we need uh, different data, uh, data types, the reason is because different data types, they have their different scalability or capability. For example, truth table is very good for canonical data, I will uh, say something. Uh, maybe let me go here. So here is a truth table example, right? Given the uh, Boolean function with uh, four variables, basically you list all possible uh, input assignments and uh, you uh, uh, decide, determine what is the output value. And it's a canonical representation, meaning that two functions are identical if and only if their truth table are the same. So that is uh, what we mean by canonical. Basically, it's some kind of uniqueness uh, for the Boolean function representation. And for Boolean formula, particularly, we are interested in uh, sometimes sum of product expression. And uh, for the set satisfiability, usually we are more interested in this kind of uh, conjunctive normal form or product of sum expression. So these are two special forms of the Boolean formula that are usually uh, being used in synthesis or in the Boolean reasoning. So uh, the plus is? Uh, uh, here is the disjunction. Disjunction, disjunction the or operator. And BDD, as I mentioned, it's a binary uh, tree. 
So here gives one example. If we have a function f that is a b or a prime c or a prime b d, so this Boolean function uh, can be represented as the binary tree. Uh, so each path, uh, the uh, for each node, it's a decision node controlled by the variable. For example, this node is controlled by variable A. If A is 0, then we take the left hand dotted path. If A equals 1, we will take the right hand uh, solid path. And uh, as long as you draw a path from the root node to the uh, leaf node, then you already give the condition of the variable assignment. And the terminal node will determine under this uh, input assignment, the output is uh, either 0 or 1. And there are some rules that you can make the BDD canonical. Uh, as I said, canonical means two Boolean functions are the same, if and only if they have the same data structure representation. But as you notice, the uh, product sum or sum of product expression, they are not canonical. Because uh, given two functions, they are identical. They are not necessarily need to have the same sum of product or product sum expression. Okay, and the Boolean network is a, just a general uh, graph where we have the input nodes, we have the output nodes, and each of the nodes in the middle uh, is basically associated with some Boolean function. So for example, this five, this node can be an end gate with three inputs coming from one, two, three, these three inputs. And for AIG, it's, as I mentioned, it's a, a spatial Boolean network where every node uh, is the end gate. So you don't need to interpret what is the, the type. Basically, it's a two input uh, end. And we use the dotted edge here to denote there is an inverter on this edge. And why this data structure is very efficient is because uh, you can have a fixed number of bits to represent uh, each AIG node. Uh, and you can economic, economically to represent this uh, kind of data structure. And that is why it is widely used in the logic synthesis to represent the Boolean functions. So uh, inverting meaning changing the direction? Uh, I inverter means uh, uh, negation. Uh, negation. Yes. And uh, Sometimes we would, uh, because the AIG here, uh, this gives one example. If we translate this graph into AIG, uh, originally we have uh, five gates here. But after translating to AIG, we have four nodes here. Uh, let, let's say we uh, don't count the input node. We count about the end gates. Uh, and the reason why there is a gate reduction is because sometimes we can use uh, structure hation uh, for this and this node. Uh, essentially, they only differ at one uh, at their negation, so that is why sometimes we can do the uh, structurally hash the AIG so that some of the gates can be merged, and that is another source of why this uh, representation can be economical. Okay, so let me quickly summarize uh, those different Boolean uh, representation. So for truth table, it's a canonical representation. And usually, it's uh, useful in representing small functions. Sum of product expression is useful in two-level logic minimization. When we talk about uh, uh, Carl map, two-level logic minimization, usually uh, we are dealing with this disjunctive normal form. And product sum is uh, uh, mainly used in Boolean sets by BRT solving. Uh, however, it's uh, rarely used in circuit synthesis. Uh, in a sense, try to represent the circuit that we want to implement uh, as physical uh, uh, for the physical implementation. And the, the reason is because of the uh, electronics properties of those uh, semiconductor devices. Uh, so for, for RBDD, it's again uh, similar to truth table. It's a canonical representation. And it's used for in uh, Boolean reasoning. And Boolean network is uh, used for to represent multi-level logic circuit, and AIG is used in multi-level logic representation as well as Boolean reasoning. Okay, so now we, uh, after introducing all these different data types, uh, in particular, we will now uh, gradually switch to Boolean set by BRT. The, uh, 
uh, product of some uh, exploration. So as we already see, uh, the product of some exploration, we have a set of clauses. They are con uh, conjunctions together. And each clause is a disjunction of the literals. And the literal is either a variable or it's a negation. We call this as conjunctive normal form CNF. And DNF is the duet, uh, dual of this uh, CNF. Basically, it's the uh, conjunction of the literals, and we have the disjunction of those uh, uh, terms. So one useful uh, thing about uh, CNF or AIG uh, is uh, somehow they are not that uh, different. So as long as you can represent efficiently in, uh, CN in AIG, you can convert it efficiently into CNF representation. So, and therefore, in our uh, domain, uh, the data type, whether you represent a Boolean function in terms of AIG or CNF, they, they are not different too much. So what we do basically is, for example, given AIG an end gate, we can rewrite uh, it in terms of three clauses to denote uh, C, the variable value, uh, is equivalent to uh, A and B. So basically, A and B implies C, and C implies A and B. So you can write this equality in terms of these three clauses. And therefore, if we, we are given this uh, AIG circuit structure, we can convert uh, in linear time into a CNF expression. So basically, each end gate corresponds to three clauses, and most uh, three literals. And then uh, you, if we want to, for example, assert the final output uh, is always zero, then we just test whether the output nine, uh, this gate output can be one or not. OK, so now we already know, suppose we represent our a Boolean function in terms of circuit, then we have a way to convert it to CNF. Now we try to focus, uh, given the CNF fo uh, formula, then how do we quickly uh, tell its satisfiability? So uh, as you might already know, uh, set is intractable, and it's the first NP complete problem being uh, proved. And in practice, the modern set solver uh, can somehow mysteriously solve very large CNF problems in the industry. For example, if we have uh, hundreds of thousands of Boolean variables and uh, with millions of clauses, uh, typically the uh, set solver can determine its satisfiability in a few minutes. And, uh, and because of this scalability, it makes people try to uh, uh, use similar technique to some more complicated problem, uh, such as uh, satisfiability modular theory or a quantified Boolean formula. So that, that is topic I will talk uh, tomorrow. So, uh, so let me mention the SMT server has been used in uh, software replication widely. So, uh, and the underlying uh, server is basically a set server. And here, uh, this slide shows the uh, progress of CESARVIN in the past uh, 10 years. There have been uh, uh, very uh, ac uh, active research area where people try to improve CESARVIN to make it uh, more scalable to solve large uh, industrial problems. And there are some ingredients uh, that make the CESARVIN efficient. So uh, here is some of the techniques that has been uh, uh, applied. So uh, basically, the skeleton of the modern set server use the uh, Davis, Putnam, uh, Longman, and Loveland, uh this kind of approach, DPLL search. And then uh, later in the uh, 1990, there is a technique called uh, conflict-driven closed learning technique being used uh, to improve the set server. And uh, in 2001, 2000, 2001, there's a, a chef a server that used efficient data structure to manipulate the Boolean uh, propagation so that uh, you can quickly determine whether there are some Boolean uh, implication happens. 
And there are some uh, decision heuristics that you can try to make it uh, the sysabber more efficient, or some restart strategy, or some preprocessing preprocessing of the CNF formula. Or uh, uh, one of the important uh, ingredients of modern server is that also provide the incremental serving uh, capability. So let's say if we, we are given a hundred of uh, pooling formula they want to serve, and each of them only differ in a few clauses, then uh, if we have such application, then it may be very efficient to use incremental serving. Uh, because uh, during set serving, we have the CDCL closed learning. And the learning uh, basically can be reused to determine the satisfiability of the next uh, CNF formula. OK, so, so here is the uh, uh, outline of uh, what is the uh, basic server uh, looks like. So basically, uh, given the formula phi, uh, we want to test whether we have a close that, that has only one literal. If yes, then there is an implication. Then we directly assign the literal to true. Uh, on the other hand, if there is a pure literal, uh, we can also do the assignment. Uh, pure literal means if given a formula, the variable only appear in one phase, so you can directly assign the, the variable to that value. And if all the clauses are satisfied, then we return true. If phi has a conflicting clause, we return false. And otherwise, we would choose another literal to assign and uh, recursive uh, on two branches. And so uh, that uh, strategy will correspond to uh, this kind of chronological backtrack. So here shows one example. Suppose we are given a a uh, conjunctive normal form formula with uh, six clauses. And uh, we have uh, A, B, C, D, four variables, uh, A, B, C, D, E, five variables. So uh, this figure shows uh, basically, first of all, let's decide, determine the A value to be zero. So uh, what happens is this clause has been satisfied. And all the clauses here uh, is not been determined. So it's uh, uh, empty here, still empty. And then uh, because uh, we cannot decide the CNF formula, let's continue to uh, assign B equals zero. So under B equals zero branch, we find there's an interesting implication here. If uh, A equals zero, B equals zero, the second clause implies C to be zero, right? And if C uh, imply zero, uh, D will be implied to be zero. However, uh, these two, a, b equals 0, would imply d equal 1. And what we need to both have d equal 1 and d equal 0. This is a uh, conflict. And therefore, uh, these two assignments lead to a conflict. And therefore, we have a conflict uh, on this clause here. And under this conflict, then we need to backtrack to an assigned b value and to assign it to another value 1. So under this assignment, then uh, we will see B equal 1. Uh, this clause also being satisfied. This as well being satisfied. But because uh, still we cannot determine the uh, satisfiability of this clause, we need to determine another variable, uh, C. If we determine it to be 0, then again, there is a sequence of implication leading to a conflict. And again, we backtrack to C equal 1. And under this case, we can uh, satisfy all the clauses. And therefore, this formula is satisfiable. So one thing we, uh, we notice is these implications are very useful. Essentially, uh, what is the clo uh, conflict clause learning is basically we want to derive some of the useful information from this implication graph uh, so that we can prevent similar mistake in future assignment to these variables. So uh, the CDC or the modern set server is basically very similar to the previous DPLL uh, algorithm. Uh, the difference is uh, we somehow, if we find some conflict, we would do some uh, conflict analysis and try to uh, do uh, some learned information 
to our closed set. Uh, so here shows a, a more complicated instance. Uh, this is some kind of uh, in the a snapshot uh, during Cesarvin, some implication graph. So here, uh, the these uh, box square uh, nodes represent the assignments, and the the node uh, over nodes here denotes those are the assignments being implied. And the color here uh, basically shows uh, the implication under a particular assignment. Uh, under this assignment label, uh, what can be implied from it? So, so for example, this is uh, under assignment label 16, uh, 23, 18, 26, 25. There are different assignments. Uh, imagine during set solving, we need to assign those variables uh, 0, 1 value. Given the assignment, we would uh, have a queue to maintain what is the uh, current assignment to the variable. And so we do the numbering, starting from label 0, label 1, and so on. And uh, for example, in label decision level 23, there are a sequence of implication, and, and so on. And this uh, implication graph, uh, what can be used is, uh, basically, we can say, given a cut of this grade to separate the conflicting node and the root node would be a legal uh, summary of the conflict. So for example, if we say uh, there is a cut here uh, that corresponds to this node, this node, uh, this node, and this node. Uh, so basically, if you, uh, uh, you try to remove these five nodes, from this graph, we would be able to separate these root nodes from this conflict node. And we can say uh, under this variable negated, uh, under these variable assignments, uh, we can summarize. As long as these variables are of zero value, then this conflict would, would always happen. So what we do is we try to add this summary into our closed database. So imagine uh, in the previous slide here, here is our original CNF formula. So during the set-solving, we would append more and more clauses into our closed database. And these uh, new clauses will help us to find a shortcut to find the, the uh, final satisfying assignment. OK? And another useful thing is uh, we can think about the, the previous closed learning is uh, some kind of resolution uh, step. Uh, uh, resolution basically is we have two clauses. For one clause, that is C1 or X. For the other clause, is C2 or X bar uh, or uh, not X. So what we can do is we can have the logic implication. The conjunction of these clauses will imply the resolvent C1 or C2. OK, so, uh, so one thing to connect the previous closed learning and resolution is that uh, the resolution step <coughs> uh, can be considered as a sequence of uh, resolution. And uh, this data uh, it will be useful uh, for resolution. In fact, it's a complete uh, set decision procedure. Uh, we can think about using the resolution to prove a CNF whether it's true or false, uh, whether it's uh, satisfiable or unsatisfiable. So basically, if you given a CNF formula, if you can find uh, a sequence leading to the empty close, uh, if and only if the CNF formula is false. So it's a, basically, it's a com sound and complete uh, proof system for CNF formula. And why that is useful is because uh, those are uh, very useful uh, technique to, to show that, uh, to provide a certificate to prove as uh, evidence of whether the formula is satisfiable or it's unsatisfiable. So for true CNF, uh, what we can easily show is uh, we can find a corresponding satisfy assi satisfying assignment. And given a satisfying assignment, we can in linear time to check 
whether the CNA formula is indeed certifiable. But somehow, if the CNA formula is false, then how do you uh, convince other people that this CNF is false? Uh, one of the useful ways is you provide the previous uh, resolution proof to show that indeed this CNF formula uh, is false. However, this uh, can, be uh, can be of exponential size uh, with respect to the original CNF formula, the resolution proof. So these are basically useful certificates. <clears throat> but you, you may wonder, uh, as you can imagine, the set, uh, set, find, uh, set assignment is uh, maybe trivial that it's useful, right? Because this is uh, a solution that you find for this CNF formula. But this proof, is in, in some sense, is not so useful. Basically, it's just a syntactical uh, step leading to the empty close. But later we will show if you use Craig interpolation, uh, somehow you can extract, extract very useful information out of this resolution proof. OK, so here comes the Craig interpolation uh, lemma or theory. So uh, the original theory is stated for the first order logic, but here we just restrict it to uh, propositional logic. So what it says is, Suppose we are to given two uh, CNF formulas, A and B, propositional formulas. And if their conjunction is unsatisfiable, uh, then we can uh, find uh, another formula, I, we call it interpolant of A, such that it satisfies the, the three properties. The first one is uh, A implies I. And the second is uh, I. Uh, do the conjunction with B is still unsatisfiable. And the third property is I uh, would only refer to the common variables of A and B. So if you uh, think about these three properties, you can uh, visualize it in this way. So uh, A here, we have a solution space. B uh, has another solution space. But somehow they are disjoint because their conjunction is uh, unsatisfiable. So what I is? is essentially a, a larger uh, solution formula. It contains A because of the first property. And it's disjoint from B because of the second property. And on the other hand, uh, more interestingly, uh, I is an, uh, only referred to the common variables of A and B. So you can think about I is a, a very useful abstract formula to summarize uh, the A formula with respect to B formula. Why this is useful? Consider, for example, A has maybe uh, hundreds, uh, thousands of variables, and B has also thousands of variables. But their common variable may be only just 100 variables. So you can summarize A uh, by just uh, 100 variables. You don't need to have the 1,000 variable. You just need to have a portion of it to basically summarize what is uh, uh, give us the useful information. And so what we would like to do is uh, basically the next step is uh, because the interpolant is related to unsatisfiability. So somehow we try to connect uh, the interpolant uh, to the resolution proof that we just mentioned. So essentially, there are some approach that you can use to convert this uh, uh, resolution proof into an interpolant. And there are two popular approach. One is proposed by Bullock, uh, and the other is uh, proposed in uh, 2003 by Macmillan. So it has some rule. I won't uh, have time to go through it. But uh, we can have a way where, given the resolution proof, uh, if you specify what is phi A, what is phi B, then you have a way to derive its interpolant from this resolution proof. OK, so uh, for incremental set uh because I think uh, perhaps we don't have much time, I would just skip this. But if you have uh, questions later on, I, I will come back to this. OK, so now let's move on to our how do we apply the certifiability Savin to uh, electronic design automation. 
uh, application. So first example is uh, equivalence checking. So what we uh, usually would face in the uh, IC circuit design is we want to verify whether two circuits, whether they are, uh, have the same functionality. And the reason is because during uh, circuit compilation, we do some of the optimization, uh, try to simplify the circuit as much as possible. And we want to uh, guarantee the, the optimization step would uh, preserve the functionality of the function. So we need to check uh, different circuits, uh, whether their input-output behavior are equivalent, are the same. So here, uh, the, pic uh, the figure here shows, uh, we suppose we are given a uh, circuit C1, another circuit C2, and they have the same uh, set of input variables. We want to determine whether their outputs are always the same. So what we uh, usually do is uh, we construct a mitre circuit. Uh, basically, we uh, XOR the corresponding outputs and then try to assert uh, after the, this XOR, the output is always zero. If the output, uh, no matter what is the input assignments, if the output is always zero, then these two, function, these two circuits will have the same function. Otherwise, if we can find some X assignment to make the output to be true, then that means under that input assignment, these two C1, C2 uh, produce different outputs. Right? So uh, as I mentioned, uh, given a circuit, for example, this is represented as a, an inverted graph AIG, then we can have in linear time to translate this into, uh, into a CNF formula. And then you can apply CSR to determine the uh, circuit equivalence. OK, so that is uh, the first uh, simple example of how to use CSR into uh, verification. So uh, next, I will show another more complicated example. Uh, here, we would uh, use the Craig interpolation as an uh, application. So you notice in this example, uh, we need the set certificate. That is the truth assignment, right? So we don't need to use, uh, there's, there is no unsatisfiability, because uh, unsatisfiability directly proves their equivalence. And the satisfiability of this circuit basically gives us the witness of, uh, for uh, for bug identification uh, to say uh, this is the bug where they cause the two circuits uh, to be different. Okay, so the next topic uh, application that, that I will show is about functional dependency. So let me first define what is functional dependency. So we say a Boolean function f of x uh, functionally depends on g1, g2, gm. Uh, if we can find some h function uh, over composite with the g functions uh, that give us the f function. Uh, so, uh, then, so then we try to see what is the uh, necessary and sufficient condition for such h function exist. Uh, essentially, uh, h exists if and only if there doesn't exist a, b, such that f of a not equal f of b, uh, only at the same time, g of a equals g of b. And the reason is because if g of a equals g of b, basically we map a and b value to the same value. And uh, by h, we will no longer uh, be able to distinguish these function outputs. Okay? And so uh, we have this... Uh, a necessary and insufficient condition. So uh, intuitively, what it says is, if g is more distinguishing than f, then h function exists. So uh, there are different applications of this uh, functional dependency identification. For example, given the Boolean network, uh, we say there is a node with function f. And there are already some existing nodes, G1 to G4. And what we can possibly do is we create another new node, H. By creating this H function, we can replace F. And so some of the 
uh, gates for the F implementation can be removed. So uh, this kind of functional dependency can be used in synthesis regarding uh, redundant register removal, BDD minimization, verification reduction, and so on. So there would be uh, some way that uh, we can use BDD to do the calculation. Basically, what we uh, need to do is we project, this is the original Boolean space, input Boolean space. And uh, we partition this Boolean space into two parts. One is those making f to be true, and the other is those making f to be false. And uh, if we do the image, uh, to project under the G function, we project it into the output space. If this uh, space, uh, they are disjoint, then H exists. If somehow they are overlap, then that means uh, there is no way uh, that we can distinguish some of the uh, A and B vertex here uh, because they will be mapped to the same uh, G output. And there is no way to determine what is the uh, F value. Uh, we cannot distinguish anymore. Okay, so this is BDD-based computation. But uh, ha what I would like to show is, essentially, we can use a prior certifiability solving to solve this. So the previous condition is this: uh, H exists if and only if there is no A B such that f of A not equal f of B. At the same time, g of A equal g of B. So what we do is we construct a Boolean formula. Uh, we assert f of x not equal f of x star, uh, and g of x equal g of x star. Where uh, x star is a fresh new variable, basically it's a copy of the x variable, but uh, there are two different uh, copies. There is no constraint on them. OK, so if this formula is unsatisfiable, then we have this condition, H exists. So basically, uh, not, there doesn't exist AB such that this condition can be translated into this formula. If this formula is unsatisfiable, then uh, we cannot find such AB. OK, so uh, in a way, we already uh, convert our constraint into the Boolean domain. Because original statement is this, but now we make it uh, to be a formula. And this can be converted into CNF for satisfiability solving. Uh, so now our goal is try to prove this formula is unsatisfiable by set solver. And uh, here to, to visualize this, let me draw a picture to denote what's going on uh, in this formula. So basically, this is a Boolean network. This is another Boolean network. And this co copy of the Boolean network, we have the x variable. And this circuit here, we have the x star variable as its input. <coughs> and so this corresponds to this. Uh, this corresponds to uh, the f part, f star, x star. And uh, let me say uh, the y0, uh, y0 here, y0 star corresponds to f function. So y0 is the output variable of f. y0 star is the output variable of uh, f of x star. And y1 to ym represent the function output of g. Uh, y1 star to ym star represent the, uh, the output of g x star. Okay. So basically, this uh, formula can be represented as a circuit in this way. And the inequivalence and the equivalence here, we simply assert f under this copy uh, should be 1. And under the star copy, it should be, output should be 0. And we assert the g, each of the corresponding g output should be equal. So basically, this circuit uh, represents this Boolean formula. And as I said, this circuit can be easily converted to CNF for certifiability solving. OK, so the, the, now the more interesting part is, uh, given, suppose we know the formula is unsatisfiable, then how do, we, how do we derive? We know h exists, but how do we extract the h function? 
So here we would use Craig interpolation to help us to compute it. So the trick here is basically in the previous CNA formula, we would do the partition. We would assert the left hand part here, we draw a cut here. The left hand part will be the close A, will be the A formula. And the uh, right hand side, uh, this sub-circuit here corresponds to our B formula. And uh, under this uh, arrangement, what we can show is because it, it is unsatisfiable. And what it really means is essentially uh, because we assert on the left hand side y0 to be 1, that means uh, the satisfying assignment to these uh, primary input variables will be the, uh, the onset of, of f function. And the corresponding uh, truth assignments to the y variable would be the image uh, projected by, by those g functions into the y1 to yn variable. And similarly here, the y1 prime, uh, yn prime will be the offset image of the Boolean function. And because the whole formula is unsatisfiable, we guarantee uh, this uh, image and this image, they don't have intersect and uh, therefore it's unsatisfiable. And we can check uh, the three properties would essentially hold uh, of the Craig interpolant. Uh, basically, what we would say is this part essentially would correspond to the H onset, basically those assignments, the max H uh, to be true. And it's disjoint from those uh, images the max function uh, uh, become false. And uh, if we check the third property of interpolation, we know uh, the phi A and phi B, their common variable is basically uh, those y1 to yn variables. It's uh, irre irrelevant to other variable. And therefore, the interpolation of this, uh, of this uncertifiability will correspond to our desired solution to the H function. Okay, so basically uh, that is the, the technique that we uh, can use from the unsatisfiability proof to derive useful info information. And uh, I guess I would like to quickly uh, just uh, uh, skip uh, incremental set solving. But if you have uh, questions, then I will be able to, to, uh, to tell this more uh, later because of the, I guess, uh, I don't have much time left, right? 25 minutes. 25 minutes, okay. Uh, then it, it's fine. Then uh, let me quickly explain this, what, what it uh, does. Uh, so for incremental set solving, for the previous uh, application, what we do is, previously we try to uh, assert yi equal yi star. Remember, we have this equality signs here. Uh, basically, we have this pair. We need to say uh, G, if they are equal, and F, they are not equal. Then we can use this G function to express F. And so what we really want to do is, if we have as few uh, YI variables, then they would be better. That means if we assert there are fewer equalities, then it will be better because f can depend on fewer g, var uh, g functions. And how do we determine which uh, yi variable are needed or which are not? We use the incremental set solving to help us do that. So what we do here is uh, we translate this uh, equality constraint yi equals yi star uh, into these two clauses. Uh, the trick here is we introduce another alpha i variable X as an auxiliary variable to control whether we want to activate uh, this uh, constraint or not. So if alpha i equals 1, then the two clauses is already satisfied. That means uh, we don't impose any constraint on yi and yi star. But if uh, alpha i equals 0, then this e equality is enforced. Okay. So what, why this is useful is because in a modern set solver, 
they provide a very useful API that we can use. So before set solving, what we do is basically we try to assert some of the variables need to be assigned to be true or false. So consider that as the label zero assignment. So under this label zero assignment, if the formula uh, essentially is unsatisfiable, then this, the server will be able to tell you uh, which of the uh, assumptions that we made at the level zero assignment uh, will lead to the country. And the information will be very useful because you can immediately tell which of the alpha i are crucial to the unsatisfiability. And you can use the information to uh, reduce the number of variables needed to express the f function. Okay, so in, in this way, we are able to uh, quickly enumerate different uh, replacements for the f function. So here is just a, a quick comparison of different approaches, uh, set uh, versus BDD. As I uh, mentioned in the previous slide, BDD is a data structure commonly used in the 1990, and set is uh, commonly used later on uh, in the 2000. Uh, later. So uh, there are different uh, advantages and disadvantages of different data type in this application. So for set-solving, we can detect multiple choices of G automatically by incremental set-solving. And it can be scalable to very large, the base function, the G, uh, the, the size of the G can be very large. And we can uh, enumerate uh, uh, different uh, target functions by incremental set solving. And also we can uh, enumerate different uh, G choices. However, for BDD, it's, uh, there is no such incremental property. So you need to check one by one to build the BDD individually. And uh, this, this advantage of set solving is basically uh, we can only find a single feasible implementation of H. But BDD will be able to find a bunch of possible implementation because of the don't care information. So here is some results. As you can see, uh, many of the uh, problems uh, for BDD is time out, basically. But for CESAVIN, you can mostly derive uh, uh, the solution. Uh, so here is the profile of the incremental solving. So, uh, as you can see, usually uh, this is in log scale. Uh, so uh, because of we use the uh, incremental set solving to enumerate different base functions, as you can see, the first solving, the first solving uh, takes the most of the time. And in the following solvings, you can reduce uh, the runtime compared to the, the first solving. And this, this is the benefit of reusing the learn curves uh, during incremental solving. And uh, here shows another, uh, I think, disadvantage of set solving. Basically, the query interpolation can be very in redundant. So, and that is an open question, how do you derive a simple interpolant from a resolution proof? And here, uh, in this presentation, I just give uh, two examples of using Boolean satisfiability in logic synthesis. But there are many different uh, applications that, uh, as I described, create interpolation and set-solving are very useful. Uh, here I list some of the examples uh, by decomposition of Boolean function, ashen hurst decomposition, uh, Boolean relation determinization, quantified elimination, uh, engineering change order, uh, decoder synthesis, and some don't care based uh, circuit optimization. All of these can be benefit uh, from using set and create interpolation. Uh, so let me summarize. So uh, Boolean certifiability is an important technology in software engineering. Although I mentioned this in the electronic design automation domain, but in software engineering domain, if you want to do some program analysis or program verification, essentially you might use uh, uh, SMT server to do it. And under nine, set is the internal uh, reasoning engine. And uh, 
I also show set assignment and unset refutation. They can be both useful. Uh, for set assignment, you can usually do the uh, uh, bug uh, finding. You can allocate the, the bug of a design. And the unset refutation is useful when you want to do some synthesis in an example of functional dependency. If you can show that some, something is unsatisfiable, you can extract useful information and use it to do the circuit synthesis. And so let me mention uh, Berkeley ABC tool. Essentially, it's a useful tool if you would like to uh, implement some uh, uh, spoon reasoning uh, algorithm, then possibly you can use the ABC tool as your environment to implement it. And some directions and challenges. So, uh, so some, we would like to uh, say find more applications of set and create interpolation. And as I mentioned, one of the limitation of uh, this set technique is the interpolant. How to sim how to simplify, get a simple interpolant. That is one of the open problem. And also, uh, there can be some interpolation in other domains. For example. Uh, you can have a linear arithmetic greater in the Boolean satisfiability, or in uh, satisfiability modular theory, how do you do uh, extract the interpolation? Uh, those are also interesting directions for future research. So uh, that's what I have, and thank you for your attention. Uh, I would say maybe the uh, skeleton of the uh, modern set server are basically DPLL search based, mm -hmm. augmented with closed learning. So basically, th this is the most fundamental part of the modern efficiency for the uh, certifiability solving. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all set solvers are compared to other solvers. Theoretically equivalent to them, uh, like CSP or ASP. Uh, uh, so programming and so on. Okay, uh, I'm. Would you distinguish them? Uh, okay, so uh, I think CSP, uh, the constraint uh, satisfiability problem, uh, usually would involve, for example, some of the arithmetic integer constraints not necessarily purely uh, Boolean. And therefore, potentially, you are asking whether uh, there are some uh, maybe potentially infinite domain of logic constraint solving. But Boolean here is always in the finite domain. So of course, you can do some translation. And that is one of the CSP technique that people have been using. But CSP, I guess, there are more uh, fundamental problems, not just the translation. Uh, I would say the translation is the big problem in CSP. How do you translate CSP into say, solving or SMT solving? And there are different encoding techniques that uh, people are trying to engineer a good uh, method to do this translation. So I would say uh, Boolean satisfiability would be the fundamental uh, engine to assist other more complicated solving like CSP or other SMT server. Other questions? OK, then maybe could you briefly um, announce your, the talk you will be giving tomorrow? Oh, yes. Uh, so tomorrow, I will try to address a, a more difficult problem, that is quantified Boolean formula. So uh, Boolean satisfiability is NP complete, right? So basically. Uh, given the, the, the uh, CNF formula uh, for the non-deterministic Turing machine, it would take a uh, polynomial time to determine it. And tomorrow, quantified Boolean formula, basically the complexity is we don't care about the time. We just care about the space. And if we can solve the problem in polynomial space, 
then this kind of problem falls in P space. And tomorrow I talk about QBF. That is the hardest among these polynomial space uh, problems. And that is a representative, representative problem, similar to a uh, set is the uh, very fundamental NP complete problem. And QBF is a very fundamental problem for P space completeness. And for example, the goal, the, the chess, uh, this kind of game, if you make uh, the the uh, the time, uh, I should say go chess is not uh, applicable. If we if you uh, by the conventional go game is a nineteen by nineteen uh, grid, you play the game on it. If you make the input uh, the ball to be scalable, in terms of the let's say our input size, we have a scalable uh, ball to play the go game. Then essentially this kind of problem is uh, p space complete. And so tomorrow will be a more difficult uh, subject to address. That is quantified Boolean formula solving. Is this also relevant for software engineering? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, because uh, when we do the logic constraint solving, from time to time we face the problem we need to do some quantification. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the quanti quantification can be nested in, in the uh, several labels. And we want to find a good solution, uh, efficient solution for, uh, for this kind of QBA formula. Okay, thank you. So the talk is at 6 o'clock at the seminar of uh, theoretical computer science lab. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.